Hi, good evening. Welcome to Public Poetry Ex Libris. Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us Leslie Ullman. Uh, Ms. Ullman has four books of poetry, which we'll show you shortly. Uh, we are here to discuss the work of Denise Levertov, one of America's uh, and the world's foremost uh, finest poets. Um, we're going to take a look at a little bit of her life. We're going to take a look at some of her, her poetry. Uh, we have guests already. So, uh, Leslie, you wanted to start with a poem? Um, yeah, do you want to do that first and, yeah. and then go back? Because you have so much good background. Um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, I've <laughs> All right. Yeah, I thought we'd start looking at the wings, and I don't know if you might like to hear it. Yes. yes. First, all right, I'm going to read it then. And um, the reason I picked this, there are a couple of things going on. Uh, I love the way her line breaks replicate the movement of her thought. Um, at times, they're more end stopped, or there's commas at the ends, and there's times when they're very enjammed. And I think she's completely in command of when she wants to slow you down and when she wants the enjambment to replicate a kind of groping aspect of her thought because she's really, this is a very speculative poem. I also think there's a lot of darkness in this poem and, and a sense, and I don't see this in a lot of her work, but there's a, almost a sense of threat that is forcing her to make, to make have this, um, this kind of speculative journey. And, and there's some things that, I can kind of explain, but I would love to hear what other people think as well. So I, I'm mystified by this poem. I'm not completely sure about all of it. So this is The Wings. Something hangs in back of me. I can't see it, can't move it. I know it's black, a hump on my back. It's heavy. You can't see it. What's in it? Don't tell me you don't know. It's what you told me about, black, inimical power, cold, whirling out of it and around me and sweeping you flat. But what if, like a camel, it's pure energy I store and carry, humped and heavy? Not black, not that terror, stupidity of cold rage or black only for being pent there? What if released in air, it became a white source of light, a fountain of light? Could all that weight be the power of flight? Look inward, see me with embryo wings, one feathered in soot, the other blazing ciliations of pale flare pinions. Well, could I go? on one wing, the white one. Thank you. You read so, that really well, Leslie. Thank you. Well, her line breaks, you have to practice her because, and this is where she and Creeley were so similar, they're replaying their thought process through their line breaks. And um, sometimes a thought completes itself and it stops, it end stops, it sends a Stanza stops, a period is there at the end of the line. But when she's in a groping, speculative mood, she's doing a lot more enjambment. So she starts out kind of uh, not enjammed, and as she gets more deeply into her questions, the enjambment increases. And then the enjambment kind of slows down at the end when she's, kind of, when she's making an arrival. And I, I just find that thrilling every time I see it in her, in Creeley. I try to do it. <laughs> um, there's more we could say about that, the way she uses white space, but she's really replaying a thought process. And that's why I trust her so much. I feel like I'm inside her head. Do you think uh, that she did this in rewriting or that it came about as the poem developed, as the poem came to be? Wow, you know, that's a great question. I've been reading a lot of her prose, and she doesn't ever address that. Um, but she does talk about 
the poet being in such an intense state of inner dialogue that the exploratory action of the poem, um, that the, the exploratory action of her content is helping her discover form. I don't know how much rewriting she did when she identified what she had discovered. Mm. So, but I think she feels there's this fusion, and I don't know if she got it right away. I don't think she ever, I haven't seen anything of hers that talks about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that once she's made some kind of discovery, she definitely wants her form to replicate that. And my guess is that it happened somewhat spontaneously. Okay. Just, just to be uh, slightly contrary, you know, when when I look at the that poem, you know, what I see is, is is one that that is 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 very tightly constructed. That the images are going to revolve around the the things that are the, those things that are behind her, but attached to her. Uh, it's got the symmetry of the black hump becoming the white wings, and whether they can become black and white, so that the the, the actual form with the line breaks gives it that sense of spontaneity. But it seems to me that this is this is a pretty crafted poem. I mean, it it knew where it was. You know, it, it knows where it's going to end up, and it, and it ends up with that uh, uh, kind of paradoxical, can I go on with just one white wing? Well, that brings up the question of, you know, once you've drafted something, you're in the dark, and then your draft tells you where you want to go, and then you, I mean, I know when I work, I try to make my, my pacing and form match the journey that I took, even though the journey itself is pretty awkward and it's a draft I would never want someone to see. I, I don't know if she's written about this. I, I think it's incredibly crafted. You're right. She knew what she was doing. Um, but when she writes about her process, she talks about inner dialogue. She talks about individuation. She talks about ecstasy. She talks about communion. She talks about these rather divine uh, sublime states of mind as though she were transported in a state of transport and I don't know if she was all the time you know she probably doesn't know maybe that's good <laughs> <laughs> no I yet, mean, you, you are kind of feel I think well why do I know only I don't know well, myself but I you see feeling along you know I it's a tone in a lot of her poems that I really like and uh, you can call it questing. I think you used that word in your essay. Uh, but you, you know, she and this is, you know, she's asking, "What is this? And what can I do with it? And uh, maybe it's this, and maybe it's something else." And uh, I, I like that, and I think she does it well. And I think the form works. To have this many couplets puts a lot of space, white space, in the poem. Yeah. I also yeah, think and sometimes she does end stops at the end of a couplet, which is only a reinforced arrival. It's it's, it's double duty arrival. And then when she wants when she wants to enjam between those those couplets, she is really pulling you um, beyond logic in a way, because she's pulling could herself you, beyond us, logic. Could you give us an example of what from the poem? Could um, you give us an example of the poem? What you're well, you know, the beginning of the poem, she's sort of setting up her question. So you have a comma, something hangs in back of me, comma. That's the first line. I can't see it, can't move it, period. End of stanza. I know it's black, comma, a hump on my back, period. So the first two couplets are really divided the way prose would divide clauses. There's an end stopping or end pausing. Then what's in it? Don't tell me you don't know. It's what you told me about. Suddenly she's breaking that up. So she's she's given us this little platform, setting us up uh, almost like here's my premise. And then she leaves her premise and then she starts doing quite a lot of enjamming for, the, for much of the rest of the poem. Co um, what you told me about, okay, there's a dash. Black, inimical, inimical power, cold, curling out of it, and, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to exaggerate the line breaks now. 
cold whirling out of it and around me and sweeping you flat. So she's, she's picking up the pace with those ands at the ends of lines, which is really weak line ending, but it's compelling because you have to get going to the next line. And then finally, sweeping you flat, there's another end stop. She is orchestrating that kind of play between enjambment and end stopping throughout the poem really beautifully, I think. And when she starts asking a questions, when she starts asking questions, um, not black, not that terror, stupidity of cold rage or black only for being pent there. That whole question is hugely enjambed. And then finally, she puts the question mark at the end of a line. Does that make sense? It, it does. It, and, it, you know, it, it, it's a, a kind of form that we're we're almost overused to, you know, of, of short yeah. line, lots of space, clever uh, enjambment. But this is 1964, when when this this when the book came out. The poems were written before then. So yeah, that that is ingenious. That the question that 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 sort of snuck in there is, don't tell me you don't know. Well, uh, who's the you? Yeah, that's that exactly my question. Me too. I wanted to throw that out to everyone. I don't know if anybody's in here, but that that's really, that's part of the dark thread underneath this poem. Um, it's, and it, don't tell me, you don't know, it's what you told me about. It's almost like this you is, is um, a force working against what she would like to realize in herself or how she'd like to see herself. Not a person? You don't think it's a person? I I think it's some, a, rep, a person that may represent something that she is trying to fight her way out of. I don't have an answer to this. I, this was the big question I wanted to throw out to this discussion. Well, one interpretation, you, you, think could, it's a you, could look at the, you could look at the fifth line and even though and take it out of the poem and just look at it as an equation it's heavy you and there's an implication that the thing she's been talking about this whole time this something that starts the poem and the it that she refers to which are the wings or the black wing is somehow linked to the person to whom she's, she's speaking I mean, that's not a guarantee. You don't look at that. I, I would think that she's addressing the weight and the darkness in herself. So you think the person that she's addressing, the you is her, herself, she's addressing herself? I think that's plausible. Well, why, why do you know the you in that next stanza, the fourth stanza, is italicized? Don't tell me you don't know. Ooh, did I mistype mine? I might have mistyped mine. You're right. No, you read it like it was italicized, I thought. Yeah, because I've seen it so much. Yeah, you're right, though. I think I, you're right. I, you know, I almost, I don't see this in a lot of this in her other work. In fact, I see very little of it. It's something refreshing. But I almost feel like she is trying to, uh, this is really a stretch, and this is not the kind of thing I would ever put in an essay because it's, it's, um, I don't know, I can't back it up. But I, I have this sense that she's almost speaking to um, not necessarily a male person, but male energy that is not comfortable with her feminine energy. And that oh. she's, trying, she's trying to find her way with her own darkness and her own power. I mean, it, some of the images in here are the kinds of things that uh, men traditionally are afraid of in women. And I, but I want to be real careful when I say that because I don't want to start interpreting her as our high school teacher or, or a raging feminist. But, but it's almost like she's defending something in herself that is impossible to define, but is deeply felt and is often threatening. And it was, it's very hard for me as a, a female person not to identify with the fact that maybe a lot of men have that problem with uh, male energy has that kind of problem with female energy. Let, let's be careful about that. 
I probably totally put my foot in my mouth on that one. Oh, here we are. I'm back. Uh, no, I, I, I saw it, read it that way, uh, not necessarily quite as, as, uh, as cosmically, but more uh, of a personal kind of an issue that, that there, there was uh, someone being addressed as opposed to uh, a male, maleness or masculinity at, 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 at large, which uh, appears later in this volume. You know, the, the volume that you've chosen uh, wisely, I think, uh, the Sorrow Dance is, is, you know, that that kind of issue of coming to grips with these really unpleasant things uh, in her life and in the world. Uh, it's the death of her sister, uh, a, a failing relationship, the Vietnam War, uh, and trying to give some form to it and, 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 and trying to in, in, invent things. And uh, it, it's a brilliant book that way in, in, in that, you know, it, it didn't, it, it, it didn't have like a predecessor where you would, you would look at it and say, this, this is the way this, this would happen. Uh, uh, this, this is a form we could use for that. You know, you know I, I think even though she uses a lot of religious terminology, a, a great deal, um, what, I, what I really got to appreciate reading um, Poet in the World this last week is that she also had a, a pretty good knowledge of psychology, of contemporary psychology, and that individuation, she uses that word in one of her essays quite a bit. And I, I almost think, too, that she's, she's trying to address what, what she thinks some other entity would see as the shadow part of herself or that maybe even she sees and is trying to integrate it and see how it can be transformed into something um, positive. Not, not completely light because she's still accommodating dark and light at the end of the poem, but it's, it's almost like she's, she's trying to reconcile a shadow part of herself with the rest of her and, and make them all part of one more um, cohesive whole. And, 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 you know, in terms of religious, she was a religious uh, person and, 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 and had a, a deep religious background, but it was a different, you know, when we think of religious ecstasy from our standpoint now, it, it, religious ecstasy has almost become kind of like a Disneyland <laughs> uh, where anybody could have it. And then she, you know, the, it, it was a very controlled world. You could have it, but uh, it, it, it was within within limits that you could, you know, it'd be kind of like a poem. You know, it would have rules. It would have things. But I think we may have gone a little astray here. Let's see if we can move along. Uh, well, does anybody else want to say anything or, or make any other ways of reading this poem, I think it can accommodate a great deal of, of different approaches, or, or we could go on to another one, or another well, subject. I think it doesn't seem representative to me of her work, although I'm not an authority on her work. This seems, you know, it's, she usually, or maybe her best known poems are concrete, pretty concrete. They, they are in the real world. This is somewhere else. It's, I don't know if you would call it abstract. But uh, we, you know, it's not grounded. I don't think it's what you would call a grounded poem. Do you have not, an example of, of something that seems more, to you, seems more typical of what she does? Oh, I guess the uh, loveliest spring, is that one? Of, that's one of the most, let me look here. Um, she usually has, is some place, and a lot of times it's outdoors. And she even talks about that in some of the poems about how uh, she she's I don't she doesn't use the word lazy but she hasn't gone outside and uh, she needs to go outside is kind of the thrust of the poem. Um, let me see here. It'd be great if you could read it to us. That poem, or uh, you know, you do uh, the earliest spring. You know where she's, it's kind of long, I don't want to take up the time if, 
if uh, people want to do something else, or you, you have something else planned. But it, it's the poem where she's young and she's, or she's writing as if of a childhood memory of going out with someone older in the spring and going along in their garden and being bored. And uh, then she, the person she's with says, oh, look, a snowdrop. She cries, satisfied, and then she, that's the person she's with, and then she looks down, and the excitement and enthusiasm of the person she's with causes her to look more carefully at a white, uh, how does she describe it, which I was interested in, thin, sharp, green, darning needles stitched through the sticky gleam of dirt, belled with white. And another, and here, look, and here. And and uh, then they see the carocas. And then she ends this. Um, this is the earliest spring of my life. Last year I was a baby. And what I saw then is forgotten. Now I'm a child. Now I'm not bored at moving step by step, slow down the path, each pause brings us to bells or flames. So she's really somewhere, and she's come alive to this place. This a very path. specific. So yeah. how do you know? That's important. That's important. important aspect of her work. And, and, and I mean this in a really complimentary way. It reminds me of you. <laughs> Well, probably why I'm interested in it. Who knows? Yeah. But, um, it, it, it's also one of the, the qualities of her work that ma makes it so ma attractive to so many people is it has a lot of entrance points. You know, if if you uh, just want to look at political writing, you know, her, her 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 poetry of witness, her political writing, you want to look at. Uh, her poetry as, as, as being a, a feminist writing, if you want to look at her poetry as, as, as having links to the past of, of uh, uh, William, you know, building on William Carlos Williams, if you want to look at it in relation to these other things, it's always there, it's always available, and, but at the same time, it always remains her, you know, you, it's always that same voice. You know, I think the, I think link right. here, the link here may be that she talks a lot about reverence. She has reverence, and I mentioned this in, in my little piece, but Patty Ann brought that out just in the piece she read. She, she does have the reverence of, of observing the world that she's in and, of, and of, ha of allowing that world to act on her and to change her. And yes, then that's right. other, others of her pieces are a little more theoretical or a little more or, or exploratory. I, I think I'm drawn to the exploratory work partly because of the way she replicates that in her lines. But that's also a reverence. It's a reverence for human experience. It's, it's a reverence for the human desire to, to know more than, than they know or the desire to change, which is something else she talks about, um, that art has to do with the the desire to change, and maybe that's the means through which someone does it. But I think reverence is what links all of this, because she, she does do beautiful observation in her work. Absolutely beautiful. And I'm no, glad you brought that up. Well, I think, I think it's a strength that, that she approaches these various things. And like Dom said, it's always her voice. So that, and she does try to grasp feelings that are are this hump on her back that's black you know it's is a, a daring of her to try to understand what that could be or is so i you know i admire her for um uh, trying all of these ways of investigating with reverence always so i think you're right actually when i read that poem Oh, well. Is there another voice back there? Yeah, I hear someone, but I can't hear them. Yeah, hear me I... too. Can you hear me now? Almost. It's getting better, but not yet there. There, I think. Oh, there we go. How's that? That's, That's better. 
all right, I'm practically swallowing my computer to do this, but never mind. Um, when I read that poem, I actually thought in many ways that she was addressing the reader. I mean, I felt in reading that poem when she says, um, oh, when she says, look inward, see me, and when she uses the last use of the word you, I felt she was actually somehow that you might be the reader itself to bring us into her. Um, I don't know if anybody else got that, but I got that with a number of her poems where I felt like she really was allowing us as readers to become intimate with her. You know, and and that was something I really enjoyed with her poetry. Uh, what a nice idea. I, I like that a lot. That the you is the reader then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she ends up with those questions and so there it is either an in, inner dialogue or some imaginary receptor for well, the it's, it's all it's also the first poem in the volume, so it, it you know it may be one of those uh, uh, preface questions of, of of the you know the larger struggle of of, of the the poems in the volume because uh, it's sorrow dance is a book about a lot of different kinds of struggles of, of, of trying to put things put things in put, uh, perspective or at least into form. I don't know perspective is quite the right term. Uh, well, I think it's kind of cool that Patty Ann had a, had something that she felt was emblematic of of Levertov's work, and I'm wondering if there are other poems that that are particularly important to some of the people out there now. You'd like to mention or even read? Me? Anyone? Anyone, Anyone who wants to? <laughs> yeah, you can do it again if it, that's Patty Ann. Yeah, Patty Ann, keep going. No, no, no. I I don't want to. I, I just didn't know, I didn't want to not answer if you were <laughs> addressing yeah. me. We need uh, you. <laughs> see, I, I did order this sorrow dance, uh, and it took a long time to get here, and they didn't have anything but used books, and it's I know. kind of, it's marked up a little bit, which didn't, bo you know, didn't bother me, but, uh, so I didn't have very much time with that book, and I I had a lot of different anthologies that had her book, her work in it, and I also, I don't know if you know about these two little books she did, Leslie. One is called the Life of, or Dawn to uh, anybody, the Life Around Us. It's it's selected poems on nature, very small. It's small in size and in length, and it's by New, new Directions, a New Directions a book, and then the other one, the very same size, The Stream and the Sapphire, Selected Poems on Religious Themes, and she says in her introduction to those two books that she had been asked to do this, to gather together from her all her volumes, poems about uh, nature and poems about religious themes and she said she realized when she gave readings she often tried to pick poems that she thought would the audience would respond to or be interested in and uh, so these so she did that she put made these little selected poems and um, so anyway I kind of depended on some of those as I was looking and reading for this gathering we were having. But um, there is a poem in the uh, one on, you know, this one on religion. It's as long as the one on nature or sacred themes or religious themes, she calls it. And I thought that the one I had marked was in there. But no, it's called Forest Altar, September. But maybe somebody else has a poem. I've already read one of one. 
Well, go ahead and read it. We, we were ready for it. Wait, wait. I think we can share our passions. And if you have more than one passion, Patty Ann, you can go for it. <laughs> well, let me read this one. Then. I don't have that be. book either, so it's kind of nice to have uh, access to that. Uh, did you ever meet her? Yes. Yeah. Did, I did met her when she... Yeah? I'm just going to say, did you get to have a conversation with her of any kind? Not really. Um, I had a colleague who had studied with her at Stanford, and it sounded like she was really, really generous to him. Just really important to him. And I invited her to UTEP well after that. It was, it was probably um, in the late 80s. And she was getting on, and her poems were rather polemical, and she didn't feel that approachable to me, but I was in charge of the reading and I, I really had to do a lot of stuff. I didn't get to hang out with her the way I would have liked. So I did not really make a connection, but I knew someone who had. And um, it was, I, I liked hearing what he had to say, but I, 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 I was glad that she came to read for us. She did a wonderful job. Um, at that point in her, in her life and her poetry, her poems had gotten more and more, I think, agendized. Yeah. That's what's you know, It's hard having reached an older age myself. <laughs> Be because you have this history. You have a history. When you start out, you know, there's nothing behind maybe the hump on your back. Um, and, and to keep up that youthful energy that you put into the writing as you were younger is just not, it's not often, it's hard to, to engender that, I think. And so I sympathize with that, with her. I, uh, I saw her when she came to Houston to read and had no personal contact with her. I just heard her. When read. was that? Uh, that was when the program just began there. So that would have been uh, late 70s. And then um, I read in Seattle at um, the university, the Washington University, and uh, there were quite a few people there. There was a long line, which I don't always have, to sign my book, for me to sign my books. And I looked back and she was standing in that line. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and that was in the 90s. And I, she had her purse you know, around her shoulder, around her neck. And I thought, you know, and I just motioned her to come up because it was a long line and everything. We did not talk there. And then I had lunch with her at Sam, Samuel, Sam Green in Seattle once. But anyway, uh, well, you have the stories. <laughs> Go on. That's well, cool. it wasn't. It's not really a story because I didn't have a one on one conversation with her ever. But I did respect her and admired what she left for us. That's, that's to me, as important as anything you do as a writer, is that you establish something that may give a younger writer freedom to try something they would like to try. And I think, uh, you know, our very best poets, have all done that. You, you know, they have forged into areas that some more than others that leaves a legacy and it leaves us, you know, her form and the way she worked with her voice in that form. Um, and what you said about it in your essay, I was going to quote that about how how they came about the form because I thought it was very interesting but I have to look it up in your work because I printed it out and um, and then she did that you know for all of us for and for women I think especially because she was there when very few women in the canon you know startling women poets and um, so she she you know, I couldn't be grateful for that. Very grateful for it. Yeah, she was very aware 
of what it meant to be a woman, what it meant to be a married woman, what it meant to be a solitary woman after marriage. And she wrote of these things with never with anger, never with any kind of defensiveness. It was more like an embracing of, well, what is happening now? What does this feel like? What does solitude feel like? What does it feel like to meet my ex-husband for for libation that's the name of the poem and it's just to sit there and wish each other well i mean she she just she she got all the things that the feminist got pissed off at she was able yeah. to name them but she didn't get sucked under by them at all and i i just have so much admiration for that oh i do too and and i you hardly ever hear any tone of self-pity right and uh, that's that's something that's doomed a lot of a lot of writing, in my opinion. But uh, she her her voice is always. I want to I want to investigate this. I want to explore this. Yeah. And, I, and often that's not the only tone in there. That's what makes her good, poetry good, like any great poetry. There are complexities of themes, not just one theme, but many working together in wonderful poems. Dom, you look like you want to say something. Thank you. Uh, would you like to do the mute? Yeah, I will. Um, oh, well, no, would somebody else like to read that? You like that poem, Dom. You you mentioned it to me when we started talking about her. Do you want to read it? You don't uh, have to, but you can. Sure. I'll, 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 I'll read it, that's fine. Those groans men use passing a woman on the street or on the steps of the subway to tell her she's a female and their flesh knows it. Are they a sort of tune, an ugly enough song, sung by a bird with a slit tongue but meant for music? Or are they the muffled roaring of deaf mutes trapped in a building that is slowly filling with smoke? Perhaps both. Such men most often look as if grown were all they could do. Yet a woman, in spite of herself, knows it's a tribute. If she were lacking all grace, they'd pass her in silence. So it's not only to say she's a warm hole, it's a word, a grief language, nothing to do with primitive, not an er language, language stricken, sickened, cast down and decrepit. Food. She wants to throw the tribute away, disgusted and can't. It goes on buzzing in her ear. It changes the pace of her walk. The torn posters in echoing corridors spell it out. It quakes and gnashes as the train comes in. Her pulse sullenly had picked up speed. But the cars slow down and jar to a stop while her understanding keeps on translating. Life after life after life goes by without poetry without seemliness, without love. Why do you like that, Tom? I, I like it, uh, one, because it it, it has uh, a, an, an appropriate sense of, of outrage for saying, you know, uh, you know, men groaning at women is pretty reasonably socially despicable, but it also has a sense of willingness to look at it as as an event as opposed to something that already has a meaning that you're that you're redefining. Uh, you know, what 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 produces this groan as opposed to a, a poem, you know, how, and, uh, she takes something which would I think ordinarily certainly in, in, in our age, be a, a, a place to be uh, more of a, of a diatribe and becomes uh, 
uh, an, an enormously sympathetic uh, kind of understanding. Uh, you know, the, a, a bird with a slit tongue, uh, a, a language stricken and cast down into decrepitude. That that you can't forget, though. That it, you know that that, that it's that it becomes real, and that that uh, uh, that life after life after life goes by without poetry, and, and embracing of things. I think. And she does. She takes herself out of it. She there's no sense of her being offended or insulted. She's talking about language. She's not talking about herself. And then she's talking about what life might feel like to people who have no recourse but to make those noises. I, I find the word in the last stanza, seemliness, to be such an interesting word. Me too. I'm not, I didn't expect that. Without poetry, without love, especially without love, I, that really hits home. Seemliness is so intriguing to me and I, I, wouldn't, I wonder what we can do with that word. I know because it stopped me a little bit because, like you said, poetry and love, well, yes, seemliness. What is that? Dignity or doing things correctly? I, I don't think it's an American word. I, I, I think that one kind of speaks to her, her uh, uh, British background. Exactly. It's a very British word. Very English word. <laughs> So what, is what, what was that? Um, courtesy and courtliness. Can oh, that me? would make sense. Yeah. Well, you okay. know, I well, think uh, a lot of English people would describe events and circumstances as being either seemly or unseemly. It's it's a very essentially, quintessentially English perspective on things. You, you would say something like uh, something like taste or, or uh, propriety? Or yeah. propriety and manners. And, and decorum. Upper. Yeah, decorum a lot. How one deports oneself, those kinds of things. Yeah. I was also it think it's courtliness? I thought that was such a cool word uh, a life devoid of that is devoid of so much i don't know if that's correct but i like it well it's parallel to where it says earlier if she were lacking all grace they'd pass her in silence the idea of lacking all grace which is you know they're they're lacking in grace uh yeah. that they are you know they're lacking in seemliness and it's it's there's kind of the, once again the poem has kind of put a mirror on itself so it sees opposites and similarities. But it it again it's it, it's also about not only the, the 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 event that starts it, but a you know a deeper kind of thinking about something where where, where it doesn't allow itself to stop with the event. But demands that the the reader and the, of course the speaker have to think about it much deeper than uh, just the you know it was a bad thing you know it was a, it was a kind of a rude item yeah we get it but uh, the notion of it like it's an it, it's a grief language that was another one that, you know that that these. Uh, these these references to language or language language stricken, uh, but she doesn't want to throw it away. It's 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 about communication, and, and and I think that's one of the other themes that that I see throughout her work is that things have meaning, that that acts have meaning, that they are communicating something that are not merely random, that they have a, a, a kind of purpose to them. Yeah. You know, in your essay, Leslie, you mentioned, uh, this is what I wanted to, I underlined, um, 
the journey of the poet's discovering her content through its emerging form and at arriving at at least revelation, if not re resolution. Mm -hmm. I like that very much. Would you say this poem arrived at revelation or resolution or I, either? I think this one arrives at more resolution than the first poem did. Um, and, and, I, and I also noticed that in its form, it had less uh, aggressive enjambment going on because it was working something out with a little bit more certainty. But I think finally, I, I think I like the ending because it is seems to be more than a revel, re, revelation. Rather, it, it has more of a resolution than the last poem did, but there's still something that resonates beyond what she's saying so that it feels both resolution and revelation, if that makes sense. And I, I have to add here, um, I think that shift into the metaphor that she does about five stanzas from the end is a beautiful move. Um, when she says, okay, it goes on buzzing in her ear, it changes the pace of her walk, the torn posters and echoing corridors, that is the hinge that gets us into the subway imagery and the train and the life after life after life goes by. And it's a very gracefully wrought little bit of extended metaphor that um, maybe for me keeps the ending more open because I'm so taken with that. Uh, but I do think that there's a little more resolution in this poem than there is in, in many of her other ones. Because she she's not really talking, she's using the subway cars as a means to contain what she's discovered. I don't know if I'm making sense, and I don't even know I'm staying with your question. I, I guess it, as I'm talking, I think I'm talking myself into resolution that is not a pat resolution. Oh, yes. I think you're, I, I know what you're saying, and I think, I think you're right about these two poems and their, and their endings. Uh, and that, you know, that, it, that, that was a very interesting metaphor to bring in the way she did and she did uh, give three stanzas to it yeah she actually shifts into it four stanzas from the from the end that is right. that's where you see her I mean you know look at the way these stanzas are con constructed if you guys have this poem um, some of them are three lines some of them are two lines some of them are one line she just right sort of seems to know when she wants the where she wants the white space and she's not worrying about doing anything lockstep. Um, but the way she works that metaphor into the ending makes me feel like I am totally in the hands of a master. Like I, I will trust anything she wants to do with me. Yeah. Um, because she's able to, to pull me wherever she needs me to go. And if she has a one line stanza, I say, okay, she wants me to arrive here. This is an arrival. There's a lot of little arrivals in this poem. A lot of those one-line stanzas. That's where, okay, I've found a landing place. Okay, now I'm going to jump off and go somewhere else. But this poem has more landing places than the first one did, and, and others of hers have. Um, I don't know if all of you have read the comment that was made by one of the people here. They wrote, I thought the ending basically made the poem. Theme, themeliness speaks to gender relations, difference between meat and heat of the animal world and the introduction of language in our human way of relating. So I'm not entirely sure what that, what you were saying right at the end, but I think that that comment that was made about gender relations, you know, um, is is really what is going on with seemliness for sure. Um, and I wish, James, you would say more about what you meant about in the sentence, the difference between meat and eat of the animal world and, introduce, and the introduction of language in our human way of relating. Could you say a bit more, please? Just because I think you've started something kind of interesting. 
I don't know if we'll hear from him. Leslie, do you have any comment on that? I love that comment. I would love to hear James elaborate on that. I, I mean, meat and heat of the animal world, it's a sort of a Levertov moment because we can all get something when we hear that. Ah, sorry, it wasn't James. It's Even though it would be nice to hear more. <laughs> it's Catherine who uh, replied. You turn on your mic by there's a little green button up at the top, and that's how you turn on your mic. I so relate to this. <laughs> I hope you find it. You'll also see it. Do you see it? Oh, dear. It's muted. There's a little icon that um, looks like a microphone and you just need to click on it or if you can see your name Catherine there's a little um Don can you there you go you should be able to just speak now you hear me yes. yeah you need to speak a little louder okay. I'm sorry to, I, I really didn't have that much more to say I just um, a little louder you may have to shout okay um, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just, you asked me to try chime in, so I, I did. Uh, right. I, 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 I um, pretty much made my point, I, I, I guess. I think, I think that, um, I, I, I think that um, to me there was kind of like, um, a sort of a, a one, one way of, of, men and women looking at each other and um, you know that's generally not part of our you know discourse our, our our sort of civilized discourse do you know what I'm sort of trying to say so that's what I thought that she was encapsulating very beautifully and very succinctly in her last lines I, I don't think I said it very well but she did I that was that was very articulate uh, I, I think one of the, the things that, that also is attractive about it is it's not part of the discourse we want to have. You know, it's not like what we think of as like as what a civilized discourse would be. But it is a, a big part of our life. I mean, it, 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 this is like 1964. This is 50 years later. You still hear groans when you go towards the subway. I mean, that's still a major part of, of uh our existence, uh, some of our communication, anyway. It seems that she's positing seemliness as a, a better world, since he it puts it in there with, you know, the, the things that we most want, with 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 love and and uh, so uh, it, 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 she she seems to be putting her vote on that side. She's giving it a real context by putting it in between those two words. I think that's, I, and I, it, that's why even though I wasn't quite sure what to do with seemliness because of the way she's contexted it, I can totally accommodate it. And that seemliness becomes both poetry and love, both a, a part of what's missing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that that sort of theme of uh, an, an eruption of unpleasant. Uh, I think unpleasantness may be a bit of, of an understatement. That that notion of uh, uh, really unpleasant things are erupting. Things are happening. Uh, go throughout the, the uh, sorrow dance. Uh, her sister dies. It's it, uh, you know there there are more and more issues like that that. that there are poems about Eros. There are poems that, that are really quite I I interesting that way, but they're, they're about com coming to terms or, or trying to find a form for the, for these uh, kind of erupting events, uh, not just uh, taking a, taking a, a, a kind of a, a poetic uh, topic and, and going from there. You know, she's not, 
it's a conflicted reaction she has to this. It's, she's not totally repulsed, you know. She says, yet a woman in spite of herself knows it's a tribute. If she were lacking all grace, they'd pass her in silence. So, so she, she, she accepts this grown as a compliment, as a tribute, and then doesn't too. You know, I think she's got mixed reactions. Yeah, and she also she also links it with language stricken language cast down so she she's she's able to accommodate so many different ways of looking at this incident you are it's right like hologram the poem is like a hologram because it's an insult it's a comment, it's evidence of language that's been murdered um through some kind of emotional poverty it's it's so much. There's so many things she's, she's letting us think about when she writes about this. I have a cat trying to eat things on my desk. I know. I have one who wants to walk across and sit in front of the monitor. <laughs> I thought I would have one in this picture, but um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I love this poem because there's so, you can walk around this poem and look at it from many different angles. That's right. She's and, totally, totally honest, seems well, to me. And you know, one of, one of the things I just reread tonight um, that helps me accommodate the many things she writes about is that she sees poetry as a dialogue the poet is having with self. This is she talks about individuation at one point that the that the poet is trying to simply realize more and more and more of the of the self, and sees the self as a microcosm of what's going on outside the self which I think has something to do with her interest in political poetry. So this dialectical thing that she's into, this is, this is what she brings to every subject, and she has a wide range of subjects and a wide range of knowledge, and, and this is what I think pulls it all together. I really like that. I think that's um, a really good summation, and... Um, I think she's, you know, she, I love the way you just use the word hologram to describe this poem. And I think that there is so much to explore in her work. And Dom, I mean, there was a, something that you said earlier about her as well um, that I also was about to comment on, but it just went out of my brain. So I apologize for that. But, um, Oh, what you were saying about her, there being so many entry points into her uh, poem. And I think that that's a really, a really telling part of, of who she is and what her body of work is. And I mean, she had, she was alive to so many things that were going on at different points in time sometimes way ahead of her time, certainly in terms of the things she said um, that address being a woman, um, and other things that are absolutely timeless, some of her spiritual um, explorations, for example, and then some things very much of the time, her anti-war work, you know, which, which is reflected very much in, in, in her work. And I just think that she is also one of those po poets that people will be continue to read for a long time to come. I think that's one of the things when we have looked at some of the other poets that um, we've been discussing, one of the issues that have come up is, is whether or not people will be reading that 50 years from now um, and how, how certain poets go in and out of fashion and others literally disappear from the landscape but i don't think she will disappear from the landscape so so i've really enjoyed this i'm really grateful that that you picked her to talk about leslie i think it, it's it's been really good for me personally and i, I hope that, that that's a beautiful summation i i'm thinking um 
I've been teaching her work all my teaching career. And more than any other poet, she has helped me help writers see what is possible with lineation, with the use of white space, with listening to the pacing of their own thoughts and letting their poems reflect that instead of getting into this kind of lockstep thing about breaking your lines at certain clauses or making all your stanzas the same length. It really helps people understand how to listen to that inner voice that she talks about in one of her essays. And I, this is just supplementing what you just said. I, her essays are so valuable. That's part of what is going to keep her relevant for a long time. But her poems walk the talk. So she had, she did both things brilliantly, and and I think that's why she will stay with us. And I still, I still teach her essays. I make my students read her, um, and if they don't do it, I keep telling them to do it. I I don't let them off the hook because there's too much value there. Well, the bell's ringing. The, the church bells are ringing. That means our, our time is up for this hour. It's gone. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating this evening. It was a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, we want to. I, I want to thank you, Leslie, for uh, uh, providing us this opportunity uh, to, uh, to get. Thank to you for letting me. A what? Thank you for letting me. It scared me, but I, I don't mind that. And and the technology was also scary, and I don't mind that either. <laughs> That's the most scary. <laughs> well, it, it's not. It, it, it. I'd like to say it gets better, but uh, no, it doesn't. I think it's better. <laughs> no, this is a you know, wonderful we, hour. It's a wonderful hour. Forward, but the time, the time goes by, and 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 people say wonderful things, and and I want to thank everybody, uh, all of our participants, uh, Patty. Uh, thanks for coming and visiting us again, Mike. Uh, those who were here and didn't talk, those who talked and uh, have left us. Uh, thank you. What's, what's uh, and, the next one? Is it Dunk, Robert Duncan? Uh, no, not, it's not Robert Duncan. Uh, right now, our, our next one is either going to be uh, Scott Hightower uh, discussing wits and weddings or mm -hmm. uh, uh, Scott Wigerman. Uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, now my mind don't ask me oh, questions. I, I thought uh, you had Thomas the James. What? So it's either going to be Scott Hightower discussing uh, wits and weddings or uh, Scott Wigerman discussing Thomas James. They haven't decided which one's going to go okay. first. Second, they're sort of in flux. But yeah, that'll be another good one. I I, I like uh, Philip Lark and and, and Thomas.